lighted talk uh, session of uh, Eurocrypt. So today it is our pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Gilles Bart, and uh, so who is our first uh, invited speaker for the Eurocrypt conference. So Gilles received his PhD in mathematics from the University of Manchester in 1993. He is currently professor at the IMDA Software Institute in Spain since 2008. And since joining uh, IMDA, he has, his research has focused on building foundations and tools for verifying cryptographic constructions and differentially private computations. So today he will speak about advances in computer-aided cryptography. So good morning and um, thanks a lot for the invitation. I'm uh, very honored uh, to be here. Um, maybe also for French people, uh, this uh, room is a bit, uh, or this place is a bit special. Um, this is actually a place which is uh, well known in France for uh, political uh, meetings. Uh, one of the candidates of the presidential election, I think, held this meeting here uh, last week. Um, luckily for you, I won't be talking about uh, politics today, but uh, it's still very nice to be in this uh, room. And um, so um, we uh, actually uh, came uh, to be interested in cryptography a bit by luck. Uh, I was uh, attending a meeting in Estonia in 2000 and uh, presenting uh, work on logic. And uh, there was a course by uh, Klaus Peter Schnorr about uh, the generic group model. Uh, and I, I attended the course and I found it uh, very exciting and uh, started to work on this uh, a bit later. But uh, really uh, what uh, got us uh, uh, started very seriously uh, in looking at cryptography, and I'm very thankful uh, to the authors for this, are uh, two papers by uh, Shai Halevi and uh, uh, Mihir Belar and Phil Rogaway, and also to some extent by Victor Schub. They were all uh, published around uh, 2005, and uh, in particular, there is this uh, very beautiful and insightful uh, paper by uh, Shai, uh, who's uh, kind of uh, suggesting how a tool for building and verifying cryptographic uh, proofs uh, uh, would look like. Uh, I don't think this paper has ever been uh, published, but uh, it has uh, served us as a source of inspiration uh, for many, many years, so we are very grateful for this. And uh, so, as I said, we also started to uh, do this work around uh, 2006, and uh, we were kind of uh, trying to uh, understand uh, uh, crypto uh, uh, just in our corner. We started from very, very far. We didn't have any background. Uh, gradually, we had a lot of uh, uh, cryptographers that uh, were answering all our silly questions, so I'm also very thankful for this. But uh, also uh, something which was uh, very important for us was uh, uh, in uh, crypto 2011, uh, actually uh, in the call for paper, which I hope you can read here, but there were some emphasis on uh, also welcoming uh, topics that uh, don't routinely appear at uh, crypto, uh, including uh, cryptographic work in the style of the CSF uh, symposium. So CSF is uh, more on computer security foundation and applying uh, formal methods and uh, um, logic uh, to security problem. And uh, so we got uh, motivated by this call for paper and uh, we uh, submitted a paper there. And um, so we were very lucky to and very happy to get in. I mean, uh, we would have not imagined if it were not uh, for this call of uh, paper, we would never have dared uh, to uh, send our work to a crypto conference because we were assuming um, Maybe all people do serious work there, and maybe it was not for us, I don't know. But uh, So we were very grateful uh, also to be given this opportunity. And uh, so for us, it has been a lot of pleasure uh, to interact with the crypto community for all this year. I'm saying we all the time, and I haven't really given names. Uh, we've been working with a lot of people, uh, mainly in Spain, France, and uh, also Portugal. But it's uh, also a lot of collaborators and um, yeah, I've been a bad guy. I didn't write their names on the first slide, but there are many of them. Okay, good. So, um, um, 
the kind of work which we had been doing initially was more focus on uh, what was the initial problem set in the paper by Shai, which was uh, trying to uh, come up with uh, tools that help cryptographers verify that their proofs are correct, so provable security proofs. But over the years, we've kind of uh, broadened uh, the kind of work which we have been doing, trying to see every opportunity available to us uh, to know, I mean, to apply what we know, which is like programming language and program verification uh, in the setting of uh, cryptography. And essentially, if you try to give a definition to computer-aided cryptography, you can think as a very broad field where you actually try to develop uh, tool-assisted methods for uh, designing, analyzing, and implementing uh, cryptographic construction. And this includes uh, both uh, primitive and uh, protocols. And uh, essentially, the methods that uh, uh, we are trying to develop, uh, they tend to be principled, so uh, they try to build on a mathematically uh, rigorous approach, uh, taking inspiration from logic, which is kind of the place we come from. And uh, there are actually many goals one w w w we could consider. So for a long time, people applying formal methods for cryptography, they were working in the so-called uh, symbolic model. And the symbolic model is uh, very useful uh, because it uh, supports automated tools, and these automated tools uh, have been very good at finding very subtle flow in uh, protocol. So this could be, or this has been traditionally uh, one of the main focus uh, of uh, computer-aided cryptography. But uh, personally, I'm also interested more than finding attack, trying to build proofs and so on. And uh, there has been a lot of work as well in trying to build uh, uh, independently verifiable proof of uh, computational security. So the basic idea here is like uh, if you have uh, actually uh, tools who can check, uh, which can check automatically uh, your proofs will be kind of breaking the symmetry between building a proof and checking a proof. And so there will be less opportunities for uh, kind of having uh, flaws in the proof because the tool will check for you. Okay, and uh, kind of a uh, more recent goal that uh, we've been uh, looking at are verified implementation. So you could think that uh, coming from programming language verification and so on, uh, this would be the first thing uh, people would be looking at, but somehow, ironically, this came a bit later. And uh, uh, also, maybe you can hope that by using tool, you will not only improve or fix what cryptographers have been doing, but you can bring your own contribution and come up, for example, with a new cryptographic design or better implementation. And I hope I will give you uh, some examples where actually uh, the fact of using tools and this principal method can actually shed some light on problems that um, were not uh, necessarily well solved be before. So kind of uh, bringing forward the state of the art in cryptography. And for this, we'll be building on formal methods, which is an area which has been uh, very active for the last 40 or 50 years. And uh, this is a huge field, and it focuses on a lot of uh, different aspects. Um, essentially, uh, the kind of uh, main goals have been to prove uh, that programs are correct, so that they achieve their uh, stated purpose, so this is uh, what program verification is about. But there's also a lot of work on program analysis, trying to make sure that uh, programs are safe, so they don't have, uh, for example, uh, kind of uh, memory errors during execution, which could be a serious cause of attack. Uh, there's also a lot of work on uh, compilation, trying to optimize uh, uh, kind of uh, implementation and come with better implementation. Uh, there is a new line of work on program synthesis, which is uh, about uh, generating automatically programs uh, that uh, meet a certain purpose. And uh, for example, I'm very excited about application of program synthesis to cryptography. I will say a few words about this uh, during my talk and so on. So essentially what we have is like uh, uh, we have a huge corpus of techniques uh, which uh, have been developed in a slightly different setting. But uh, one thing which I find very exciting is try to take these corpus of techniques and apply them to cryptography. I think it is, uh, at least for me, it has been a great source of fun. 
and there are lots of uh, very uh, exciting problems that we've been able uh, to look at through this lens. Okay, so the potential benefits, it's actually something which is good in both directions. So um, uh, essentially, um, if uh, you're able to uh, develop good formal methods for cryptography, you can expect higher assurance, uh, which was uh, originally stated in the paper by Shai, for example. But I also believe it will be uh, very useful to uh, narrow the gap, gap between uh, provable security and crypto engineering. So there is some kind of a trend, uh, I think uh, you can mostly coin it until the, under the word uh, real world uh, crypto that uh, uh, Kenny and some other people have been uh, trying to develop, come up with security definition that match more closely uh, the reality of implementation and so on. But as you do this, things are becoming more and more complex. And uh, eventually, so this is my belief, people might disagree with this, but I believe that formal tool, they give you some kind of bookkeeping and way to tame the complexity of proof, and they will be really necessary if you really want to end up uh, bridging the gap between uh, security proof and low-level implementation, crypto engineering, which tends to worry about, let's say, assembly-level implementation. And I don't think you can go uh, the whole way in be between the two if you don't have tools to do this. And as I mentioned, uh, you can also expect uh, new proof techniques. Um, on the other hand, so this is the kind of propaganda saying, yeah, guys, I will save you and so on. I don't know whether I believe in this very much or not. But uh, also for me, uh, kind of uh, uh, applying uh, formal methods for cryptography has been a great, great source of example. We got lots of very challenging examples, very nice, uh, problems to think about and uh, also uh, it helped us develop kind of a new uh, theory for programming language verification and so on. So uh, we also get a lot from this. So a lot of fun uh, but also a kind of new interesting theoretical challenge to look at. Okay. And uh, so uh, here is a kind of long-term goal of uh, computer-aided cryptography. So uh, I will not make a bet of what I mean by long term, um, my supervisor was uh, looking at a formal verification of mathematics, made a bet to me uh, many, many years ago about uh, when mathematician will be using proof assistant to uh, verify their theorem. And I, I think he's on his way to uh, lose his bet. There are more 25 more years to go, but uh, I don't think he will make it, so I won't make any bet. But uh, here is a kind of ideally where uh, we could uh, try to go. Okay, so this is kind of a reductionist proof, and this reductionist proof is uh, trying to show that uh, assembly level implementation uh, is uh, secure. And uh, so what you're going to show is like, if you have an adversary that breaks the as assembly code, then you can uh, build an adversary that breaks the design. Okay, so this is kind of a, a reductionist statement and you expect that with provable security, uh, you show that there is no adversary that breaks the algorithm, so you would be done. Except that in the middle, you have to throw in uh, two assumptions that uh, will actually be handled using programming language techniques. One is uh, saying that uh, uh, the assembly code is kind of good quality. Uh, I'm not going to specify very much, but let's say it has to be safe. So it has to respect some uh, kind of uh, programming discipline that uh, doesn't make bad things happen, and it has to be leakage resistant. I will give an example of what I mean by leakage resistant. This is by no means uh, the only definition, but uh, this would be the first goal. And the second goal is that the assembly code correctly implements the algorithm. So the assembly code meets its intent, okay? And uh, so if you manage to do this, essentially, uh, this is the, what I meant by uh, closing the gap between provable security and implementation. And uh, so for the first thing, assembly code is safe and leakage resistant. You can try to use program analysis, which is actually what uh, tries to achieve this kind of property. And for the second step, uh, assembly code correctly implements the algorithm. You can use program verification and uh, also uh, verified compilation. So verified compilation is a kind of a new line of research which tries to show that uh, a compiler preserves the functionality of programs. 
Okay, so uh, that would be really cool to get there. There are many challenges, of course, so uh, it's not for tomorrow. The first challenge is uh, to build uh, models. So uh, there's a first problem, which has nothing to do with crypto, uh, which is that uh, building models of uh, execution platform is actually a very big challenge. So if you really try to give a semantics of uh, x86 or ARM and so on, this is kind of a big mess. So already uh, trying to uh, specify this is uh, something which is uh, very hard. And I'm just talking about the functional behavior. Like uh, I give you an x86 program, for example, you r I run it on the platform, which result do you expect? And this is fairly hard, okay? Um, second problem, uh, we're talking about uh, leakage resistance, so you really have to build models of leakage, which is also extra hard. There are some people working on this, and, but this is something that uh, needs uh, more research. And the other problem is really being able to come up with a realistic model of adversary. So as I mentioned, this is something that uh, real-world crypto tries to do to a certain extent, but there is more work to be done. So more, both at the uh, algorithmic level, which is essentially where real-world crypto is uh, kind of uh, uh, trying to look, but also what it does it mean uh, to be an adversary when you are executing uh, on a platform. So there has been some work on this direction. So let's say, for example, you're considering a, a virtualized platform where the adversary is executing in some other partition and so on. So there are some work in this direction, but they are uh, very preliminary. A uh, second problem is that, uh, you know, if you want to verify this, you actually need to have candidate libraries to verify. So you need good, efficient code uh, that ends up being safe and leakage resistant. So this is also uh, something that uh, is very hard uh, to come with. Uh, today, uh, I'm not aware of everything that is going on in a kind of uh, crypto libraries, but there is no immediate candidate uh, for uh, verification. I mean, it still uh, these uh, libraries need to be built. And of course, this is a huge challenge for formal methods. Uh, we need to uh, kind of uh, uh, develop uh, kind of new theory, and there's a lot of engineering uh, to be able to get all these pieces fit together. So, uh, on the other hand, the situation is not hopeless because there's a lot of uh, work which has been uh, going on in this area. So, uh, as I mentioned, and maybe somewhat Ironically, uh, most of the work has been focusing on uh, kind of security rather than uh, areas where uh, formal methods have been uh, traditionally applied to. So there's a lot of work in uh, trying to build uh, uh, tools for checking security in the symbolic and the computational model. Uh, we've been uh, working on a tool called EasyCrypt, which I will be uh, describing uh, shortly, but there are many other tools. Uh, there's an increasing number of tools that focus on side channel analysis. Uh, I'm mentioning here two kinds of tools. Uh, tools that are uh, focusing on uh, constant time verification, uh, constant time cryptography, so try to avoid uh, cache based uh, timing side channels. And uh, there's a second kind of tool, uh, which is kind of more focusing about uh, mask implementation. Uh, kind of uh, protection against DPA attacks. So I will uh, present briefly uh, two of these tools as well. Um, there's uh, also some work on analyzing for safety, so the trust in soft analyzer, which has been applied to uh, some TLS implementation. Um, there is some work on functional correctness, so functional correctness is also very important for security. It's uh, any time you have a very stupid bug, like a carry bug, it can lead to an attack. So this is also something which is uh, very important. And uh, there are some uh, tools there. So there's a crypto which has been developed by Galois. There's a number of tools which kind of leverage uh, 
proof assistant and certify compiler in uh, particular this uh, ComCert VST tool chain. Uh, develop, uh, so ComCert is developed at Inria, VST is developed at Princeton. Uh, there is this uh, tool called uh, GF the Reef. Um, and uh, there is also a kind of a parallel uh, line of work which tries to kind of develop uh, principal implementation, so CASM and Boring SSL. There's a lot of work that has taken place as well. Uh, I think mostly at John Hopkins University trying to mix uh, formal methods and uh, cryptographic engineering. So there's a lot of tools that have been developed and published at CCS over the years. So there's a lot of work that is going on. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I think these works have led to very promising result. Uh, I would not say that in isolation any of the problem has been solved, but uh, we're going in the right direction. What is slightly more uh, new is kind of integrating this tool, and uh, uh, there has been uh, a very few case study that show that to a certain extent you can actually uh, mix this uh, direction. So uh, last year we uh, did uh, some work with uh, uh, my friends in Portugal and a colleague in uh, uh, Spain where we looked at uh, an implementation of a small uh, component of TLS. So we built our own implementation uh, stemming from the fact that uh, first of all it makes verification simpler and also uh, it's not clear whether uh, there is a kind of a good implementation available to start with. And uh, so what uh, we did here is actually uh, looked at all aspects. So we had a, a security proof using uh, EasyCrypt, so a standard style of uh, provable security. And uh, then uh, we just had our C implementation, which we uh, showed uh, functionally equivalent to our EasyCrypt specification. And then uh, we compiled the C implementation using ComCert. So this is actually uh, what gave us this result, which I mentioned, that uh, the generated assembly code has the same behavior as what we had in EasyCrypt. And uh, then uh, we had a type system for verifying that the implementation is uh, cryptographically co constant time. So this way we handled uh, the side channel analysis. And uh, so this is a very small example, but uh, it shows that everything can be done together, at least on this small example. And there are some other examples. We had previously done some work on PKCS. Uh, people at uh, Princeton and Harvard have been doing some work on HMAC, although, um, for example, in this case, they don't look at side channel. Uh, there is uh, some work on uh, Hackle Star, which is being done uh, here in Paris at INRIA, uh, which uh, focuses on uh, functional correctness and side channel resistance. Uh, there is the work on uh, TLS. So there's a lot of work that tries uh, to combine different of these uh, aspects together. So in the, I mean, in the end, it's a long-term goal, but I hope it's not a crazily long-term. So uh, the tool which we are using for doing uh, this first step of this proof is uh, called EasyCrypt. And you can think about it as a kind of domain-specific proof assistant. So there are lots of tools for reasoning about mathematics, reasoning about program. We built our own tool. And uh, we built our own tool because we wanted our proof goals tailored to reductionist proof. So reductionist proof, they have a kind of different flavor from standard program verification, because when you do program verification, you reason about one program at a time. Uh, when you do reductionist proof in this game, hopping style in general, uh, you have two probabilistic experiments, and the goal is to relate these two probabilistic experiments. So this is uh, something which has uh, became known uh, as a relational verification. You have to reason about two programs at the same time, and these two programs are probabilistic, which is also a bit new from the point of view of program verification. So we decided it would be better to come up with our own tool. And uh, so uh, our tool is uh, kind of supporting uh, many common proof techniques that are used in crypto, so like, uh, especially in this code-based game playing approach. So we have this bridging step, failures invent, hybrids argument, eager sampling, and so on. And uh, we have support for all of those. 
And the kind of uh, key philosophy in what we are trying to do is like the proofs that you guys are doing are not that easy. So it's uh, difficult to think that one day there will be one tool that uh, you push button and you get fully automated proof for any kind of uh, statement you give. So uh, at this point, it's very important uh, to have very good control as a user on uh, the tool and you will try to guide uh, the tool to build the proof for you. So this is what we are trying to do. And uh, so we are kind of uh, taking from this uh, two modes of doing proof, the proof assistant. So we have something uh, inspired from Coq and SS Reflect, which is a kind of proof assistant that has been used for uh, proving the biggest uh, statements in uh, or the biggest example of formalized mathematics. So for example, uh, they proved the Phi Thompson theorem. Uh, which is a big chunk of mathematics, or the four colors theorem before. And uh, we also have automation uh, backends to uh, SMT solvers and computer algebra systems, which are very useful. And um, so, how did we manage to um, get uh, these uh, proofs um, or build a tool that actually uh, is able to deal with this? So, it's not so easy, but um, uh, and uh, we, are, we were quite ignorant, but it turns out that in the end, what we needed uh, is uh, to take inspiration from uh, something that arises uh, quite um, uh, frequently in the analysis of Markov chain, for example, to prove rapid mixing. And uh, so we use something called uh, probabilistic coupling. And so the basic idea of probabilistic coupling is like you have two probabilistic processes and you try to establish a relationship between them. And uh, so that's exactly the situation which we are interested in. And uh, how do you do this? So the basic idea is like you can think about these two processes and they have independent randomness. But if you want to say something meaningful about the relationship between the two processes, you will have to say something about the way the randomness in the two uh, process uh, kind of uh, ties together. And that's exa exactly the idea of probabilistic coupling. Instead of seeing these two probabilistic processes independently, you will build a single probabilistic process that uh, kind of emulates the behavior of the two. And so every time you have a random sampling here and a random sampling here, you're actually going to build in a random sampling in the product uh, process. And this random sampling, in a way, will tie uh, the way the two random sampling uh, behave in each process. Okay, so that's uh, the definition. what the definition of uh, coupling is actually doing here. You're saying if you have a uh, two distribution over A, so uh, we are lucky to be uh, in crypto, uh, or at least in the style of crypto we're looking at, we're dealing with discrete distribution, in fact, sub-distribution, so things are a bit simpler here. And essentially, you have mu1 and mu2, and the coupling is just uh, distribution over the product space such that when you take the first marginal, you get the first distribution, the second marginal, you get the second distribution. And then there is uh, this notion of R coupling. So essentially, R is the relation you want to establish and uh, if you want to establish this relation, you have a further constraint on the coupling that you have to come up with. And uh, so this notion is actually uh, very useful for cryptography because for different choices of the relation R, uh, you will be able to uh, formalize steps in uh, uh, crypto. So for example, for a bridging step, uh, the relation R will be equality. And then you will be able to show that the probability of the same event is the same in uh, two different games. Uh, for a failure event, uh, you will the relationship will say, oh, the two results are equal, provided some bad events does not happen. And then you can actually bound uh, the difference in probability for the event X in the two games. Uh, by uh, the probability of not f, okay? Uh, this is a slightly different statement from what you usually see in crypto papers because we're working with sub-distribution, uh, so we are just getting this max ex instead of uh, just one of the two. And uh, then for a reduction, it's just kind of uh, an implication, R has to be an implication between the two winning events. So essentially what I'm trying to show here is like these couplings are kind of a great tool uh, to formalize a lot uh, in reasoning in crypto. So is it uh, 
one of the questions that we had, so first of all, initially we had, uh, we did not realize that what we were doing were couplings. Uh, we had this definition, but we didn't know the connection. And uh, two years ago, um, I was uh, working with a student uh, at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, he's uh, just in Shu. He's actually uh, more interested in uh, differential privacy. But he came up with this connection, and uh, yeah, I was, uh, I'm still very excited about it. And uh, so the question is like uh, whether uh, uh, recognizing uh, that um, what we are doing is probabilistic coupling is uh, something useful. Um, so uh, as far as I, s I can see, there has been some prior work on using couplings in crypto. There are a few papers. It's not so widespread. Uh, and the way they use it is kind of uh, different. I don't know whether it's, um, so I don't have the answer whether it's a very uh, useful insight. But one thing which is sure is like for us, it was the key to build this uh, scalable verification infrastructure because uh, we don't have to reason about uh, probabilities when we do this game hopping. Uh, we just have to establish the coupling and we deal with probability later. So that was the key to do have something scalable. And uh, also uh, it's uh, very useful for dealing with generalization because when you want to look at the more general settings, uh, this uh, kind of connection with coupling is very helpful. So we've been doing a lot of work on differential privacy and uh, observing the relationship with coupling. We uh, very recently came up with uh, the right notion of coupling for this particular setting. It's a notion of approximate coupling and uh, we prove a version of a, a theorem called Strassen theorem, which uh, really tells us we have the right notion. And also some years ago with uh, Dominic Unruh, we got uh, very excited about um, uh, e extending our work to uh, quantum crypto. And uh, we thought we had done the hardest part of the work because uh, uh, we had found a great name for the, for the tool. It would be called QuiziCrypt. And uh, the problem is that uh, when we tried to extend lifting to the quantum setting, it was not so clear uh, what the definition would be. But now we know there is this connection with uh, uh, probabilistic coupling and opti optimal transport. There is actually some work on quantum optimal transport and people have been coming up with notions of coupling in this setting. So we can try to uh, see whether this works. So it's uh, for us, I think it's very useful. Okay. So what we do is like, um, we have this code-based approach to probabilistic coupling. This is a language which is very close to what uh, Mihir and Phil have is in their 2006 papers. And uh, so we uh, kind of deal with this game playing techniques using this uh, relational hall logic where P and Q are relation on states. So we don't talk about probability. So in this sense, it looks very much like uh, standard verification. And uh, uh, then once we have done this, this gives us, uh, by the kind of results I've showed you later, some kind of probabilistic inequalities. And so to conclude, you just have to uh, bundle together this probabilistic inequality and also resolve some probability bounds for some events. And for this, we have a logic that helps us give uh, upper bounds for the probability of events in a, ga in a game. So this is actually traditionally where a lot of work in verification of probabilistic program went, but there's a lot of limitations still. So for example, if you try to use concentration bounds or reasoning about independence, this is not something that, that is handled so well. Um, this is some ongoing research area. And then of course, you will need to bound the execution time of constructed adversary. And uh, in principle, this is something which should not be too hard, but uh, we've been very lazy and uh, we did not really build the tool support there. Although there is one area of theoretical computer science called uh, implicit complexity theory where they have developed type system and so on. We could try to use their stuff, but uh, we never did. Okay, so uh, very quickly, uh, I won't go very much into detail, but this is kind of what the proof rule looks like. So essentially the way it works is like you have a big program, you apply some rules, and you get smaller programs. So it's like in whole logic or program verification, you build your proof backwards. Uh, we have a rule for random assignment, which is uh, where the magic goes. But essentially what we are doing here is kind of uh, building a coupling, a special kind of coupling, which uh, we call bijective coupling. And uh, just with this, we can go a long way. So we've been doing a lot of example. 
uh, kind of the latest example which we've been doing is uh, uh, one uh, kind of a building uh, um, pla a verified platform for a secure two-party computation based on garbled circuit. Uh, we had a small project with NIST about verifying uh, indifferentiability from random oracle of SHA-3. Uh, my colleagues recently completed a proof of uh, privacy for an e-voting system. And uh, so uh, doing this proof, we got some uh, kind of um, mechanizing them. We found some subtle points. Uh, so on the other hand, uh, it's true that uh, these uh, interactive tools are uh, time consuming and uh, difficult to use. So back in 2011, when we got our paper, we say for the working cryptographer, uh, I think we were a bit too optimistic, I have to say. Uh, I mean, if a working cryptographer starts using our tool at this point, maybe it will stop uh, being a working cryptographer fairly soon, which was uh, not our intention. Uh, but uh, actually, uh, Manu my friend Manuel Barbosa is always suggesting there could also be this uh, lightweight approach where actually you use our tool just to write your probabilistic experiments and the kind of sequence of game without doing the proof. And this would be already very useful because uh, there won't be type checking errors in your program and there will be some kind of structure and you will be able uh, to get some um, uh, early bugs. Um, so this is something which would be valuable, but I guess in the long run what you want is uh, to have more abstraction and more automation. Okay, the problem with automation is like it's somewhat problem specific. So we've been doing a number of work on a highly automated proof and um, I will go quite uh, quickly about this, but essentially the basic idea is like this proof which we are doing in relational hall logic, they are at the wrong level of abstraction. When cryptographers do proof, they have this high level principle and this is what should be automated because otherwise uh, people will get lost in trying to use our tool. I think uh, Jonathan Katz had this uh, kind of uh, uh, very nice uh, saying about uh, EasyCrypt, which was there was some kind of impedance mismatch uh, when you were trying to do use the tool. So it's really our job to try to go up at the level of abstraction that you guys are doing. And so some basic observation here is like many of the proofs which, uh, or many of the principles which you are using, they consist of two parts. One is like coming up with some information, and this is one where the smart smartness uh, comes into place, and then once you have coming up with this uh, kind of information, check that it's the right information. So, for example, if it's a reduction, it will be, you will give a like the adversary, and then we'll have to check that it's uh, really uh, simulating well. And uh, so, like uh, the second part could be automated, and uh, in a principal way, and then for the first part, you have to use some heuristics. And uh, so, this is something that works pretty well in practice. We built a tool. Uh, for, for example, DDH-based cryptography. We applied it for many examples in pairing cryptography. Um, so uh, one thing is uh, very hard to come up with a sufficiently rich set of high rule, and this is something that uh, what could try to work on. But also something which I find very exciting is that uh, sometimes uh, instead of using heuristics, uh, people have been looking at a building decision procedure. So this is a kind of algorithm which you know uh, will return the right answer if it exists. And so there was some work by Jutla and Roy in 2012, but there was also a paper at uh, Crypto uh, last year by uh, Kammer and Rosulek. Actually, Crypto for the first year last year had a special session on uh, automated tools. So that was uh, for us. Uh, we were not on this session, but that was a big uh, good news. Okay. So um, we uh, also did a lot of work on automated proofs in the random oracle model. And uh, essentially what we looked at is like uh, one of the first example which what we did was uh, formalizing OAP. It took us six months and uh, that's an enormous amount of time. And then we tried to understand whether we could automate this. And uh, we actually built a tool called ZooCrypt, which was able uh, to do this. And essentially what we did there, and I think this is a general principle, it's very good to build two tools. One which is very good at finding attacks, one which is very good at finding proofs. You run the tools, uh, so if you are just going to look at lots of scheme, you just run the tools that find attacks first, because most of the stuff you will come up with is junk. And then on the one uh, which are left, you try to run the proof. 
and uh, we had a very good coverage rate. So, for example, for CCA secu uh, CPA security, it was almost uh, full coverage. It was uh, less good for CCA security. And then you have uh, this gray zone. And uh, so what we did uh, for this gray zone is uh, we had uh, this uh, nice oracle called uh, David Poincheval. And uh, it worked very well. Uh, he actually uh, came uh, with a new scheme, which was on our gray list, called uh, ZAEP, for which uh, he could actually uh, prove uh, in CCA security for RSA with uh, small exponents. So I have to say here, like the ZAEP stuff, the proof was mechanized using EasyCrypt, but all the smallness came from David, not from us. Okay, the last thing which we did, I won't say too much about this, but uh, we also work on the building automa automated proof in the generic group model. And uh, this is uh, something where we get uh, uh, pretty nice results. So the latest work which we are doing is uh, with some people at ONS and uh, we're trying to apply this to attribute-based encryption. So there's lots of opportunities to try to get automation in different models and so on. Okay. So uh, let me try... Uh, to go now to the second part, which was about uh, side channels. And uh, so uh, essentially we've been doing two uh, lines of work. One is in, uh, on constant time cryptography and one is on masked implementation. Um, there's a well-known fact that uh, when you want to break crypto, you're not going to try to break the math, you're going to try the implementation. And there are plenty of evidence that uh, timing attacks can be kind of a disaster. They help you uh, to recover the key and uh, more or less they work remotely. So you really better not have stupid timing attacks in your implementation. And uh, kind of a gold standard for eva uh, avoiding uh, cash-based uh, or protecting to the best extent against the cache-based timing attacks is a cryptographic constant time. And essentially what it uh, suggests is like the control flow and the memory access should be independent of secrets. Okay? And so it looks like a pretty simple thing to achieve, but it's actually very hard to achieve. And uh, so we have a funny story about this because uh, while uh, trying to do our work uh, last year ago in trying to devise tools, uh, for checking constant time. Uh, we look at this uh, S2N implementation of uh, uh, TLS by uh, Amazon Labs, and um, uh, we found a timing attack there, and uh, uh, they actually told us, yeah, guys, you are too late. Uh, there are uh, these guys in London, so Martin Albrecht and uh, Kenny Patterson, who already found an attack, and we fixed it, but it turned out that uh, what we attacked was their fixed implementation. So um, really, if you are a programming language guy and you say, oh, constant time, you say, oh, this is not such an interesting property. It's very easy to achieve. It turns out that it's not. So it's uh, very useful to have tool. And uh, more or less, you can have a great tool by being extremely lazy. So uh, we uh, actually realize that there is some work which has been done in the context of uh, compiler verification by Zach and Pnueli in 2008, and it was tailored to check that uh, compiler optimization is correct. And it turns out that what they propose is sound and complete for, relatively complete, for verifying program counter security. And the way it works is like, you start from one program, and you again actually build another program that emulates two runs of this program, okay? So you just run the program twice in lockstep, and every time you reach a branching statement, you just have to check that the two executions take the same branch, okay? And every time you do a memory access, you just have to check that the memory access is made uh, at the same location, okay? So this uh, is uh, something which is beautiful. It's sound and relatively complete, which means like uh, if the transform program uh, doesn't raise any assertion failure, then uh, the original program is constant time, and that's if and only if. Uh, it supports advanced notion of constant time. For example, you can have some public outputs. And uh, 
with a very thin layer of code, we've been able to implement this of, on top of an existing verification framework for LLVM called SMAC, and uh, we applied this to many libraries. So that was really nice. Uh, we have some ongoing work trying to extend this to a vector instruction, and uh, we also applied this to SuperCOP, but because in SuperCOP you actually don't know, uh, or at least we don't know, uh, whether this implementation are meant to be constant time or not, uh, it would be uh, nice to have a counterexample generation so that uh, actually if there is an implementation for which our tool says it's not constant time, we can actually come up with values that we can run and show it's not constant time. So this is what we try to do. Um, we are uh, also uh, doing a lot of work, and this is something which I got extremely excited about as well, uh, well, basically, I get excited about everything, so I should stop saying it. Uh, differential power analysis. So uh, there's a lot of uh, work this is being done, uh, sometimes in the chess community, but you get also a lot of paper here on trying to uh, building mask implementation to make sure that uh, uh, programs uh, are resistant against the DPA. Okay, and uh, so there are these uh, two uh, models, the thresholds probing model, uh, which was introduced by uh, Ishai, uh, Sahai, and Wagner some years ago, and which is a beautiful theoretical model for analyzing mask implementation. And there is this uh, more practical noisy leakage model uh, that was introduced later, and there is this beautiful result uh, at uh, Eurocrypt uh, 2014 showing that the two models are equivalent. So it's kind of, uh, you get the best of the two worlds, you have this theoretical model which you can use for uh, verification and then you get good guarantees. And so we decided to try to understand um, essentially whether we could apply our techniques for um, mask implementation in the uh, threshold pro probing model. And uh, we didn't get the ID just by ourselves. Uh, there has been some prior work on this. There is this uh, very nice uh, paper at CHESS 2012 who actually uh, uses language-based technique to analyze mask implementation. Uh, there was a follow-up the year after with a tool called Slate, which I also believe was presented at CHESS 2013. And then there were some formal methods people uh, that uh, also published at uh, CAV. Uh, 2014. So this is this was very exciting work for us because essentially we realized here that what masking security deliver is uh, something which is exactly uh, an instance of uh, something that people have been considering in our community. And uh, so their work was limited to low orders and does not compose well. So we wanted to try to see whether we could do better by just looking at more advanced technique. So uh, essentially, uh, the idea of uh, probing security, I'm not going to go so much into uh, the details here, but uh, uh, very often um, cryptographic notion of security are stated in a simulation-based style. Uh, we don't uh, state our notion in a simulation-based style. Uh, we normally state them as something which is called two safety, which means uh, we consider two execution of the program and uh, we assume the inputs are related and we look at the relationship between the output. And so it looks uh, very different, but in practice it isn't. Uh, to convince yourself there is this very simplified case here where you have a function that takes two arguments. And uh, if you're a cryptographer, you will say, oh, there exists a, a function that only takes the second argument such that for every uh, two element A1 and A2, F of A1, A2 is equal to G of A2. Okay, so uh, this is kind of the natural way you would think about. Uh, for us, we will think about two run. So we would say, oh, uh, you give us A1, A prime one, and A2, and uh, they have the same result. Okay, and uh, so there are kind of two different uh, formulation, but they end up being equivalent. And uh, this is something which for us, allows us to take your definition and move them to our world. And uh, so using this, we've been uh, building a tool which uh, uses a, a probabilistic non uh, proofs probabilistic non-interference. And the basic idea is like uh, when you do masking security, you have to look at uh, every possible set of T observation. So this is something that uh, 
grows very, very fast. And so uh, when you build a tool, you just have to find a way to deal with lots of these sets at the same time. So what we did is like instead of looking at sets of T observation, we were looking at very large sets under a certain criteria and uh, just making sure that we were covering everything. So in practice, there is no reason why you would run better than verifying all the sets. So in theory, there is no reason why it would be better, but in practice, it worked much better. So we were able to analyze a lot of uh, implementation. So you see, for example, uh, if we would be uh, looking at uh, this uh, S box, a third order masking, you will have to verify probabilistic non-interference two billion times, which is not a very good idea. So uh, our, our technique allows us to do something which is much better. And uh, then the last uh, thing which uh, we've been doing and has been presented at CCS last year was trying to build full implementation because this first work was actually looking at uh, masking security of one gadget, but really what you want is to achieve uh, masking security for full implementation. And so what we did is uh, we introduced a new security notion, which is compositional. Um, I will show in my next slides that there is a problem with composing mask gadget. So we have a new notion that uh, makes things compose. That means you can analyze smaller components and then you will make sure the full implementation is fine. Uh, this is something which is uh, fully automated and we have a type systems that uh, make sure that the implementations are secure. And one thing which is nice by uh, having full automation and type system is also uh, there is something which is very costly when you uh, build a mask implementation is to insert refreshing gadget. So refreshing gadget, they don't change the functionality, but they increase security. But this has a cost. And uh, if you have a type system, you can let the type system tell you, yeah, you should put a refreshing gadget here, or you don't need to put a refreshing gadget. So you get much more efficient uh, implementation. And uh, we used it to mask a lot of uh, implementation, A AES, Ketchak, Simon, Spec, and so on. And we get generated code, which is uh, reasonably fast. So for example, if you mask AES at order seven, it's about 100 times slower than uh, uh, mask implementation. I don't know whether people are interested to mask at order seven, but uh, we have a tool, we just have to give which order we want to mask, so we try it. And uh, so uh, I don't think I still have 20 minutes left, so... Uh, probably much less. Yeah, ten, minutes. 10 minutes, okay. So let me go very uh, quickly uh, over uh, the problem with composition. So uh, essentially, uh, and I'm going to use this uh, uh, simulation uh, based notion, but so you have a composition of uh, gadgets and the adversary is going to make uh, less than T observation, which are split across uh, the different gadgets. And uh, you would like, to, so you know that each gadget is uh, uh, achieves probing security and you would like to show that the result achieves probing security. But the way it works with the standard definition is like essentially you have to carry back uh, all this number of observation uh, up. So when you're doing your simulation based proof, so you have this uh, tier three observation here so if you just uh, use the fact that uh, the first gadget is uh, kind of non-interfering, you will go and get T2 plus T3 here. And then when you arrive at T1, you get T1 plus T2 plus 2 T3. Okay, so you're already uh, kind of unable to proceed. Okay, so this is uh, an observation which is not ours, but uh, which says that when you just take non-interference or uh, masking security, as standardly stated, uh, composition does not work well. So what we propose is a notion of strong non-interference. And the basic idea here is that we are going to uh, distinguish between internal observation and external observation. Okay, And uh, the notion of simulation, so you just uh, need uh, as many uh, inputs as the number of internal observation to do the simulation. So you can think about as a, a strong non-interference gadget as some kind of barrier. And uh, this barrier means that everything which you have been observe, observing uh, up to then is going to be lost once you cross a strong non-interference. And uh, fortunately enough, 
This is not a completely crazy notion, but because a lot of, not all of them obviously, but a lot of gadgets from the literature already achieve this notion of strong non-interference. And uh, so once uh, you have strong non-interference, again, you have this setting here, we've put a refreshing gadget. This refreshing gadget is strongly non-interfering, so you just care about the number of internal observation. And so when you go up, up here, this t3 observation, they will go here, so you get t2 plus t3. But then when you go here, you uh, actually get uh, TR, because the T3 don't count, because of the notion of strong non-interference. So when you arrive at A1, you get T1 plus T2 plus T3 plus TR, and when you go there, at the top, you get, again, T0 plus T1 plus T2 plus T3 uh, plus TR, which is smaller than T, which is uh, what you wanted, so you're done. So this is how you achieve uh, uh, compositionality with this notion of strong non-interference. So I think this was very cool because uh, we have this nice notion and this is one of the examples where I think we can uh, kind of uh, beat cryptographers. Like what we propose is advancing the state of the art. Maybe, I mean, I hope that people like strong non-interference. And uh, so that was very nice for us. Like uh, we don't feel like uh, donkeys uh, following smart cryptographers for 15 years. Maybe we have something to say. Okay, so um, I think this is something very nice. And uh, so uh, there is some further work that needs to be done. But in general, one thing that makes me very excited as well is like if you're a programming language guy, really the first thing we should have been looking at is not this reductionist proof. We should be have been looking at kind of uh, information, theoretic, uh, security, this is kind of the thing which is closest to actually uh, what we know how to do. And I actually believe there's a lot of opportunity uh, to try to look there and apply our techniques. So for example, it would be interesting to look at MPC and see whether our techniques can apply there. I think there's a lot of uh, potential here. And uh, the other thing which I find uh, kind of uh, exciting is like our techniques also apply to active attacks. So, uh, you know, when you look at fault injection, uh, if uh, so, uh, in uh, it's more in software engineering, but uh, uh, people in software engineering are looking at this problem of program repair. So you have a program, the program doesn't do what you want, and you have automated methods to fix it. And like fault injection, you can think about it as adversarial program repair. Like you have a program, you cannot break it, you inject fault so that you can break it. And uh, so you can transfer this program repair stuff uh, in uh, the setting of crypto and you can come up with new and interesting attacks too. So this is uh, very good. And uh, so uh, to wrap up, so I think what we've been doing is kind of, uh, or we hope we have been doing is kind of uh, building useful foundation and tools for achieving higher strength crypto, uh, looking at provable security and practical crypto, but also at reducing the gaps uh, between the two. And uh, there's a lot of uh, very exciting uh, direction. So uh, I hope we still have fun for another 15 years. But uh, so kind of uh, directions which I'm uh, very interested in are kind of adding more automation and looking at different application domains. Uh, we are also uh, looking with a number of people at, uh, uh, ca carrying these methods for high speed uh, implementation. So there is this. Uh, idea of developing a programming language called Jasmine, which looks very much like Chasm, but which is uh, certified and so on, and uh, that would be very interesting. Uh, I already men mentioned language-based methods for information theoretic security, and I didn't talk too much about this, but I also think uh, uh, automated synthesis of uh, crypto construction is something very excited, and exciting, sorry, and uh, there has been some uh, great work on this, so there was a CCS paper for, uh, actually there was a previous paper by the same group of people at Maryland, but they look at uh, uh, kind of uh, authenticated encryption and they came up with lots of great construction fully automatically. I think that was uh, very amazing. I actually got the best paper award at CCS. And uh, there is also this uh, crypto paper this year, which I already mentioned. And uh, I'm also very hopeful we can do something for quantum cryptography because we have a great name for the tool, so now we have to do the research. <laughs> Thanks for your time.
So we have time for questions. Any question? No. So I, I have a question. So uh, if I want to, to verify a side channel uh, implementation using uh, your tool, Mask Verif, wha what would be basically the, the complexity for, for me as a cryptographer? Do I have to implement the, 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 the algorithm in a special programming language? Or uh, wha what is the, the, the learning uh, curve for, for, for so a cryptographer? So for, uh, sorry, we are right now, I don't know whether this is the best choice, but what we did is our tool uh, works on uh, C programs. So um, it's probably not the best choice if you want to do something kind of uh, industrial or whatever. But uh, so it's written in a kind of, uh, uh, let's say comfortable uh, subset of C. And uh, so it should not be too difficult uh, to write uh, programs um, in this uh, fragment. And uh, we have kind of uh, plans to extend uh, slowly the language, but I don't think it's extremely uh, painful. We have more, much more painful tools to use if you're uh, interested. When, uh, when you talk about the relational uh, decomposition, do you include the platform stuff, or was that separate, like ARM or x86? You were saying the platform was very difficult to include. Is that included? Uh, oh, you mean in the verification work that we did? Uh, in this particular example, uh, the uh, MECBC, we uh, did uh, not, so we generate assembly level code, and our uh, adversary is just an adversary that has access, uh, let's say, to the trace. So for us, the trace is just the sequence of a program point and the memory access. Um, in this particular work, we don't look uh, at justifying this adversary, but uh, we have an independent work with uh, colleagues in Uruguay. I forgot to mention that some of this work is also with people in Uruguay, where we actually show that uh, this model that we have is meaningful uh, for a certain kind of virtualization platform. So this is something that has been formalized in the core proof system building on top of Comsat. That's quite a big development. <laughs> <laughs>